All right, folks, hopefully this will be a relatively short video, but one, I just want to go over some general ideas of a flip that you can do uh, at the elementary school level, and then I mix the middle school, high school level together because it's just obviously different dynamics, um, but you can work more like middle school, high school can work more in, in sync with what they're doing as opposed to the elementary school. So uh, a big thing about understanding the elementary school flip is that it can be done. You, you can do this with young kids. But it's not the traditional way of flipping. It's not like we said in the original video where homework is done uh, in school and schoolwork is done at home. That's a little difficult to do. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, I have a little one and I, I know a lot of you guys have been through this or are going through this and understand that homework at home is is a way that it's, it's not always productive for young kids and that's okay. So with this idea, what I'm, I'm encouraging is you don't have to be traditional and flip, but you can still do this and you don't have to bring in homework into the equation. Um, but by making videos that are accessible, it can still be looked at at home and reviewed and practiced, no doubt about it. So when you look at elementary school, I think it's a little bit difficult to do a full-fledged flip uh, like I can do at the high school level. Uh, but you can definitely flip a lesson, okay, especially when students need a lot of help in something, okay. Uh, this makes it a lot easier. You can get to more... Um, young brains when you're doing it this way so definitely start with a lesson and need a lot of help with uh, any video you create and what I'm going to encourage with videos made here are videos that are made for direction okay giving the students direction what they have to do that way you're not listening uh, to students ask you over and over how to do something they can go to the video and kind of learn it there and then try to work on it and again you have peer collaboration okay but definitely with young kids keep their videos short under 10 minutes and that's looking at anywhere between one to two minutes per grade level keep everything relatively short so that they can kind of grasp what you're asking them to do and move forward and of course you gotta know your set your your students and which you will you know you guys are with them so much I, I I have a lot of respect um, for what you do because I couldn't do it I need to move mine along and get another group in so um, I'm really, really amazed at what you guys can do at the young level, and, and it really shows with what we're getting for sure. So obviously knowing your students, start with a center in class, kind of figure out a way to how to mold this in or mix this in a little bit as you go along, and definitely have a way to check for, for progress, you know, whether, again, it's a process. So find out where the processes are being met or where they're not being met, and that's where you bring in the next part of remediation and practice and, and kind of repeat that idea, but allowing them to kind of get the conceptual knowledge, especially for what you're being asked. And again, goes back to that math again. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, when you're doing this, you can model through the flip. So, for example, if I'm making a video on how to give a direction, maybe when you're making a video, you show them on the video what you're asking them to do. And they can kind of see, not just hear you the direction, but they actually see you do the direction or do the task at hand so they can learn how to figure it out as well. Um, you know, I think that's going to work well for the math people, the science people, uh, any kind of equations. It's going to work well for reading, uh, any kind of language art. To see what you're asking them to do or to understand makes life a lot easier for them. Okay, so like I mentioned, put the uh, videos, the directions on video so they can go back to it. You can spend more time helping. You become the tutor, not just the teacher, uh, as opposed to just saying, oh, these are directions I gave you. These are directions I gave you. Um, I'm even going to start to look at doing this for my high school kids that when I have a certain task that I want them to complete, especially one that's done online, I might just make a video that says, here, here's what the directions are. If you need to go back, don't ask me. Just go back to the video, and then I'll help you with the fine details of what you have to create. Uh, definitely keep, and I'm, I'm really, most of you do this already, but keep the lesson in small parts and maybe create video directions for each part. Okay, that way as they move along and, and you're doing this within your classroom, they are seeing you and hearing you, but they're also getting your help when they need it. And of course, you have natural student collaboration. Those who can will, and they'll also pull those along with them. And that's a big part until they become more comfortable to do it on their own. And, and my suggestion is because really this is where the flip classroom began in, in the business world in math, technology, engineering, start with a math lesson. You know, that's where they seem to struggle. Some of them seem to struggle the most. Or start with a reading lesson. Either of them work really, really well. But the key here is, you know, and, and, uh, and I kind of fear this as a parent myself when the time comes for my daughter to learn math. I told you I'm not a good math, uh, wasn't a good math student, not a good math person. My wife handles all that stuff. She's a lot smarter than I am. She married me. But anyway, I, regret, I digress. Um, this will help parents understand what the Common Core is asking as well, okay? Uh, instead of having to be beaten over the head, you're also teaching them because they're the ones who are doing it at home, doing the practice at home with them. 
All right, for the middle school and high school flip, definitely uh, a little bit different than the elementary school flip for sure. Um, <clears throat> my suggestion again is, is go little by little. Don't just jump into a flip full time because it's difficult. I mean, it took me two and a half years. I spent a half a year really molding what I wanted to do. And then I kind of worked on it over the summer and jumped into it again for the next year. So it definitely took time and I'm, I'm evolving every day every year as we go along so begin with individual lessons give it a try ease into it okay and this really goes regardless of the topics you teach or whatever content you teach you know and that'll be kind of shown in other later um when i send you this this presentation i'm not going to do a video on those because there, there's just a lot of stuff and i don't want to get people beaten down with different videos all right um definitely at the middle school and high school level create collaboration if we're looking at creating um citizens and people that are ready for the the private and public sector making them good hard-working people you know collaboration is going to be huge it's there the the job force the workforce today is very much a collaborative workforce uh, especially with multidisciplinary um uh aspects to the job so really creating collaboration is going to be huge i know we work towards that but this becomes a natural collaboration especially when technology is involved and again i go back uh, many times over become the tutor instead of the teacher while we're in class uh, that way you're not the sage on the stage you become the guide on the side and you help them out a lot um, definitely incorporate checks and this is a big thing i use zaption i use zaption mainly uh, ted ed play pause i've used play pause before when it's called educanon just change the name uh, you can incorporate multiple choice questions uh, thought-provoking questions just simple checks that give you data in return and give you feedback in return that way you can plan your lesson based on what they're accomplishing what they're not accomplishing or start the class off by what you figure might be a weakness uh, and try to build it into a strength of course all right and that goes of course playing the lessons based on their needs um, welcome the students into the uh, idea that they have control of what's happening in class um, so really and this can go for elementary school as well no doubt about it but you want a higher level thinker especially as they're maturing to start to become more involved in their education more uh, accountable for their education but also more involved in how the learning is going to happen because as we know they all learn differently okay so really we start you know look at student choice when you have the personalization of their learning and it's going to happen in stages it's got to happen in a tiered system where early on you're still the center of what's happening in the classroom yet you start to bring in ideas from different parts of the class and you can kind of dictate which ones are good which ones aren't good and get them more involved they're starting to take ownership of how the class is going to go and then when you get to another lesson you know you step back and you look at what the learners the students are doing and then you co-design with them you know you create a lesson you have the foundation the skeleton of the lesson but then they start to fill in the body they start to put in the parts they're going to make their learning and whatever's going to work best for them okay and then eventually it becomes they're completely driving the class okay you're still the content foundation because that's what's happening at home but when you get to the actual class setup, the teacher and the learner become a partner in, in not just a co-designer, but a partner in what is becoming accountable for the learning. And you still have the ability to kind of to work and, and mold them, yet they are starting to become the creative mind behind what happens in the day-to-day -day classroom. I think that's a really great idea because, again, when they are the ones talking, they are the ones learning, and that's huge. All right. We look at some other ideas, and this really goes for, uh, and this can be done in a lot of classes, I think, but really the science, technology, art fields, anything where it's more hands-on, this idea of maker space, um, learning through experimentation. You know, you're starting to see this. Um, it's very Montessori in its ideas, uh, but definitely through plain experimentation. I think this is where, um, if you look at on the global stage, where Finland is really taking the lead is that they are doing things through experimentation, through play, through active kinesthetic learning, through audio learning, through visual learning, through sound, whatever the case may be, through through music. They are taking all of their aspects of education and putting it through what the students are going to react to. So I think, you know, with that experimentation idea that they're trying things and figuring out, you start to bring in other aspects of education. Um, 
whether it be a history lesson or something that was seen through a novel or some kind of, of a nonfiction type uh, material, or you start to bring in a mathematical principle, or you start to bring in an idea from a foreign country, okay, which can tie into a foreign language group, or the artistic movements that are out there, and blending them all together, and now you have this cross-disciplinary disciplinary, and you're having creation. And rather than consumption, you give, you give, you give. Now they're giving, and they're the ones figuring it out. Another one that I'm starting to, to kind of buy into is this idea of genius hour. And it's not all the time. It's not an entire hour, so don't worry. But giving a little bit of time each week for the student to kind of take something that they're learning and put it to a passion of theirs. And then they dictate how the lesson may go uh, and, and through what their ideas are in their creation so they can kind of move forward. And I think, you know, it gives them, again, ownership and accountability for what they want to learn in the way they want to learn it. So hopefully these two videos have been relatively helpful for you. We're going to do more of this in the session. You're going to be very hands-on. Again, that's the idea of the flipped classroom is you have the accountability. So you're going to be like the students, and you're going to take ownership of how we're going to create this and definitely move forward.